appreciate the brother's heartfelt prayer. I think that was, uh, uh, I just I appreciate the uh, opportunity to, uh, to stand before you, and I just ask an interest in your prayer. Amen. There's, uh, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 35, there's a, a verse in here. Now, I know Paul, in this particular verse, he is speaking particularly about marriage. But I think we can use the, the context in today's sense. And, and the portion that I, I refer to is where he says, that ye may attend upon the Lord without distraction. Right. There are so many distractions in this world that we have right now. And, and we know from the distractions here, even just within the church, we can look some on here and the emptiness that is here in this church because of the, the distractions that are going on in this world right now. Right. And, and there are many. Right. But I'll tell you, we, as Scripture says, that we need to attend to the Lord. Amen. We need to keep our eyes focused upon the Lord because God is on His throne. Amen. He is in control and He understands and He knows what's going on. So we need right. to maintain our focus without letting the outside distractions get in our mind. Amen. You know, we should study and we should meditate and we should pray to the Lord. Mm. And and again, I, I greatly appreciate that prayer, brother. That I was... Um, Amen. Amen. I, I just appreciate that. <clears throat> Amen. When we uh, when we take on a study of the scriptures, and whenever we speak to others, mm-hmm. we need to understand first and foremost who the scriptures are written. Mm-hmm. When we, again, when we begin to study and read the Scriptures, to whom is the Scriptures written? Is it written to everybody, every man, woman, and child that's ever walked on the face of this earth? Or is it written to the saints? Is it written to the children of God? Is it written to the elect? And and I believe that if we were to study and, and look we would find that the Scriptures are written to His children. And we can see this whenever we do our studies in Romans chapter 1 and verse 6. And I'm going to go through many verses here, just, just portions of them. And, and Lord, I'm going to, Lord, I'm going to hope to get through this just as quick as possible. And brother, I, uh, I have a tendency of sometimes being long-winded or so I've been told many times. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> in Romans chapter 1 and verse 6, we're told, Among whom are ye also the called of Jesus Christ. So he is referring to those who were called of Jesus Christ. We move on in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 2. He, Paul is writing, writing to the church and to the church of God, which is at Corinth, right. to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus. Amen. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 1, it is written unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, with all the saints, which are in Achaia. Right. Galatians chapter 1 and verse 2, unto the churches of Galatia. Ephesians 1 verse 1, to the saints which are at Ephesus. Right. Philippians 1 verse 1, to all the saints of Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi. Right. Colossians chapter 1 verse 2, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae. First Thessalonians chapter one verse one to the church at Thessalonians, and he repeats that again in Second Thessalonians chapter one verse one. First Timothy chapter one and verse two unto Timothy, my own son, in the faith. Second mm-hmm. Timothy to Timothy or Second Timothy chapter one verse two to Timothy, my dearly beloved son. Mm-hmm. Titus one ver- chapter one verse four to Titus, mine own son, after the common faith. And it goes on, Philemon chapter 1, verse 1, James chapter 1, verse 1, to the twelve tribes, First Peter chapter 1, verse 2, to the elect, Second Peter chapter 1, verse 1, to them that have obtained like precious faith. Right. 
sanctified. Jude chapter 1, verse 1, to them that are sanctified, and Revelation chapter 1, verse 1, to show unto his servants. Right. So we can look and see when we, we conduct a study in this alone to whom are the scriptures written. Right. To the saints. Amen. To the child of God. To the elect. And, and we need to understand that, that to whom are the scriptures written. Amen. Again, it's not to everybody. Amen. The Lord gives a hearing ear yes, he does. to his children. Amen. But I, I set that foundation to move on. Mm. When Adam was first formed of the dust and God created us, there was something that he had or Adam had that we do not and never will have. Never will have that. And to get as basic as one can get, we see in the beginning from within Genesis that it was God who created man and woman from man in Genesis chapter 2. Right. And when God created mankind, here we have the potter having not only dominion right. over the clay, but he created us. Right. He created Adam and Eve. Right. They were his creation. Nowhere did man have a say in his own creation. Amen. Nowhere does Scripture tell us that he has a say, that we have a, even a right. right. But many times we hear, especially when we talk to individuals, to other men or, or women or whoever that we may speak to, that they think they have a right. right. They don't have a right. Not with God. God is all powerful. He is the cre the creator, right. the creator. Amen. And in Isaiah chapter forty five and verse nine, we read, "Woe unto him that striveth with his maker." Right. Amen. What a powerful Amen. warning right. is that! Amen. I don't think he could get more powerful than that. We move on. Let the potsherd strive with the potsherds of the earth. Shall the clay say to him that fashioneth, What makest thou? Or thy work, he hath no hands. Okay, now when we go back and we look at this scripture, first, and, first thing I want to look at or bring a point to is the very first sentence, the very first point that he's making, Woe unto them that striveth with his maker. It is nothing but pure arrogance on man's part to think that he can even question God. Right. But he does. Yes, he does. And that is the sinful nature of man that we have. Amen. But he moves on. He says, let the potsherds strive with the potsherds of the earth. Mm -hmm. Now, when we look at this, the potsherd is a shred. It's a fragment right. of a piece of pottery. It's not the entire pot by itself. It is, right. it is just a fragment. It's a portion of it. But he gives us this warning for a reason. Right. And, and that's something that we need to take into consideration when we, when we do study right. the Word of God. And we, when, even when we share Amen. the Word of God. Not only did he create us, he could destroy us if he wanted. Amen. God could destroy us that fast, if not faster. Yes, he could. But yet man, in his pride, and man is in his arrogance, questions God. And this is, it is a, um, it's an absurd statement for anybody to call God into question. Right. Now, God, God gave us literal life. And we know this because of creation and right. God creating Adam and Eve. And after sin entered into the world, and specifically in the Old Testament which that's my point I want to bring up, there was a blood sacrifice that had to be made right. in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, there was also a blood sacrifice, but the big difference is that that blood sacrifice was the perfect blood sacrifice, which was our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. In the Old Testament, in Leviticus chapter 1 and verse 3, and in many, many places in the Old Testament, when we look and see and study on the, the sacrifice that was made, it was a male right. without blemish. Right. 
In the New Testament, our perfect sacrifice, Jesus Christ, male, without sin or blemish. And, and to have that understanding, we need to know and understand the Old Testament and the New Testament. So what is a testament? And this is the point where I, I want to spend the majority of my time, what time I have left. When we look at the word testament, there's something that, that we should remember. And there is something that we should take notice of. And many people have taken, and even in, in different translations of the Bible, they've taken the word testament out and replaced it with other words. And last Sunday I attempted to speak... And, and I mentioned in, in Revelation chapter 22 and verses 18 and 19, we're warned not to add, because if we add, he will add plagues. Right. Or in verse 19, to take away right. from the prophecy, from the scriptures. We're told not to do this. Right. Absolutely. But we still see man does this yes, in his does. pride and arrogance. Yes, he does. In, in these other translations, again, man has, has taken this word testament out and he's replaced it with the word covenant. Right. Now, the problem with this is that there are two stark differences between a testament and a covenant. When we study the meaning, the proper meaning of these words, there is a difference. Right. And we need to understand that every testament, and hopefully I don't confuse anybody here, every testament is a covenant. But not every covenant is a testament. That's correct. And this, this should give us caution in what translation that we use in scriptures. And I'm not going to mention the specific uh, translation, but I've seen it with my own eyes. And it's, it's, uh, when I read this at first, I'm thinking, that's not right. You cannot use that word in place of testament because, uh, well, I'll get to my point. The word testament is never mentioned. And when we do a study of the word testament, the word is never mentioned in the Old Testament. But yet when we look in the New Testament, this is where we're going to find this word, the specific word testament. That word testament is mentioned 13 in 13 different verses. Well, now, if we study and if we've done a study of God's word, we understand that the number 13 correlates with the word curse. Or cursed. Now, because of God's covenant love for us, you know, He made a provision for us. In, in Galatians chapter three and verse three, thirteen, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree. Christ, the Son of God. The Son of Man was made a curse for elect man. Exactly. He hung on the tree of the cross in order to redeem us from the curse of the law. Right. And he bore our curse for us. Mm -hmm. and, and according to Second Corinthians chapter five and verse twenty one, we read here, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, right. that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So, again, when we look at this, Christ bore our, our curse and then imputed his righteousness unto us. Right. So, when we look at these two words, covenant and testament, well, both of them are legal terms. Right. And again, if we've done any amount of studying in the scriptures, we see that God uses many, many legal terms in the Bible. Right. And these are just two of them. Mm -hmm. A testament... Is, uh, is something that is freely gift, gifted to some, someone. Right. A testament does not require anything upon an, the other party. That's correct. Now, examples I want to give an example one, a, a covenant. A, a covenant, again, it, it is a legal document. It is a contract between two or more people. Right. And when we look at this, it, it is a, in this sense, when we, when we study God's word, the covenant such as a covenant by God, it is binding. Right. It is binding. This means an, an obligation, and it cannot be broken. That's right. Amen. And it will never be broken because God doesn't lie, nor, nor does he ever change. Amen. But a covenant requires something to be done. Right. 
So when we look at even the, the, the covenant that God made with Noah, right. what did he do? What did God do? He set a bow in the sky. Yes, he did. And he, he set that bow, the rainbow in the sky, signifying that he would never destroy the world with, with a flood or with water again. Right. But there are many covenants mentioned in the Bible, and, and there's, uh, and I've mentioned this before, we spoke on this, on the covenant of salt, right. talking about the preservation right. of, his, of his children, of his elect. Then there's the covenant of grace. Many covenants in the, in the Bible. Right. One covenant that we all know, or should most of us know about, is, is the marriage covenant. Right. And in this example, we see that the co- this is a covenant that God established for man. Right. In, in, in marriage and in the marriage covenant itself, we are to do something. Right. Men are to love their wife right. as Christ loved the church. Women are to honor their husband. Right. I'll say this. Neither of those come naturally right. to us. And this is something that is a, it is a struggle for us. And this is something that we must, we must work at. It. it is something that we must, we must do. Right. A testament. Okay, so what is a testament? Again, a testament such as a last will and testament. When we go back and we search and we, we study the word testament, Testaments have been around for many years, and they were before the time of Christ. Right. And it is, again, it's a legal document, and it is also binding. But the difference is that it requires death. Right. And a testament isn't worth the paper it's written on until that person dies. Right. And this is why it's very important when we look at the at the various translations out there, why it's very important that we use a correct translation here, right. because the two do not interchange with one another. Right. So uh, another point I want to make about a testament is that it is it is something that was written by a specific person for specific people. Right. Now, that person for which the the testament is written or the testator, he chose again. Who he put in this testament. Yes, he did. The person who is written into this testament, we didn't write it. Right. They didn't write their name into this testament. This was something that was that was done by the testator himself. Amen. And that person, he, he freely chooses. And here's an example. My dad, for instance, I know he has a last will and testament. I have a copy of it. Right. Now, and this is something that, that is not in effect Again, it's not worth the paper it's written on until that person passes from this world. Right. But within the testament, again, he's the testator. He wrote it, right. and he is the one who's freely given or to gift right. what he wants to give his children or to whoever he, he chooses. Right. I didn't write it. My brother didn't write it. My sisters didn't write it. This was something that he, he wrote himself. And this is because of his property. His. So while while the covenant is in effect, while those who are involved are living, a testament again requires or does not go into effect until the testator dies. So when that person dies, that which is, is written, that which is in the, the testament, again, it is freely given. That's right. And again, it, it, it goes into effect at that point. Amen. That he dies. So where do we find this? There, there's again, there's 13 verses in the New Testament that mentions testament, and I, I want to look at at one or actually a few right now in Hebrews chapter nine, right. in beginning in chapter fifth or chapter nine, verse fifteen, going through verse eighteen. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Butterfingers. In, uh, in verse 15, And for this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Right. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of a testator. Right. For a testament is a force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. 
whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated without blood. So we go back and we look, and beginning in verse 15, who's the mediator? Well, if we were to go back up in, in the previous verse, in verse 14, and for a time of brevity, and I'm, I'm going to go way over my time, brother. Um, but um, who's the mediator? So we, we, we know if we go back and look in verse 14, it's Jesus Christ. It tells us that it is his blood. Furthermore, in, in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 5, we're also told here, for there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Verse 16, as we go through here and look at this, he tells us that the testament requires the death of the testator. We've already covered this. Verse, verse 17, it goes on and tells us that for a, a testament to be in effect or to go into full force, that requires the person to be dead. Amen. Otherwise, it is of no strength. It has no bearing. Right. Verse 18, we see that it was, it was dedicated without blood, or for the old or the first testament. Right. So, so why is this important? And, and why must we know the difference. There are, again, there are translations that take the word testament out of these verses, and, and especially in Hebrews, and this is what shocked me when I, when I read this and I saw this, and it replaces it with the word covenant. And, and what it does is it takes away and it diminishes the death of Christ as our sacrifice. Exactly. When you take the blood of Christ out, the death of Christ out, you pervert it at that point. There are four elements to a testament that I want to look at. And, and they're, they're provided in the verses that I mentioned above. The one is the testament. We have the testament here. Two, it's the mediator. The mediator of the testament. Three is the testator himself. And four, the time that the testament takes force. When does it take Effect. When does it go into effect? So where do we find the testament? Well, let's go back to Romans chapter 8 and verses 29 and 30. So if we look in Romans chapter 8 and in verses 29 and 30, we see, For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, then he also called and whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. The, the details of this testament tells us a lot. Amen. It tells us many things here. One, it tells us the beneficiaries of the testament. Exactly. Or those who God foreknew before the foundation. The elect. Right. This answers the who. The second point is that it, it points out the benefits of the testament that those named beneficiaries are to be finally glorified and conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. Amen. The third point is that the mediator of this testament is Jesus Christ. That's right. And he is the one who calls us. He's the one who justifies us. He's the one who glorifies us. Mm. And this is according to his terms, right. not ours. The fourth and last point I want to make is that the testator... The testator of this testament is Jesus Christ. Amen. And so when we, when we look at this and we notice that once the testament comes into force, it's too late to add names. Exactly. You can't add names to the testament. Exactly. You can't remove names from the testament. Right. So when Christ, the testator, died, that testament came into force. Amen. It did. So now, amen, brother, and now the terms. The terms, it cannot be changed. Right. The terms of this testament. Amen. The beneficiaries cannot be changed. Right. And, and all of the labors that so-called preachers and, and others, you know, understand that they're, one, they're doing this in vain. Right. Understand they have a heart for the Lord. And have a zeal for the Lord. But it's according to ignorance. Amen. 
We, under, we need to understand that, that these names, they are eternally fixed because the testament is in force. When we look, again, look at, looking at the manner in which the word testament is taken out of certain translations and replaced with covenant, right. it, it doesn't fit. Right. It, it does not fit, and it cannot fit, right. because it requires death. Exactly. So if, if there are other translations that want to interchange the same word, are they now saying that a marriage covenant is a testament? Mm. That doesn't even fit. Right. Because marriage is all about life. It's not right. about death. Right. And this is where it's very, very important to put, or put everything into its correct context in what we do. In, in Hebrews, in chapter 9 and verse 22, we know that without shedding of the blood is no remission. In other words, without the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, right. there is no sin right. that is forgiven. Without the death of Christ, there could be no satisfaction. And without the satisfaction, there could be no peace with God. Amen. Matthew 26 and 28 tells us, For this, this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Amen. Mark 14, 24 and Luke 22, 20 reiterates the same fact. So we see that Testament takes death. Amen. And it is the peace with God in, in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 22 that I, I would like to spend just the last few minutes. And just as the scriptures tell us in Genesis that the serpent was subtle. Just as we know that Satan is a master of disguise. And he uses camouflage to, pe to deceive people all the time. There are those who have taken God's word and added or have changed. Right. They've changed the scriptures. And, and because of that, it, it causes confusion. Yes, it does. That is deceptive. Right. That is a disguise. Amen. And that is as the serpent being subtle by changing words that, you, that cannot and do not fit. First Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 33, we're told, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, Amen. as in all churches of the saints. Right. When there's confusion, there's no peace. That's right. We don't have peace if there's any type of confusion. And when people take words out and, and change the context, there, there is confusion here. Exactly right. That's why there's so many people that they don't understand, and then when they come and they ask you, and they look at you like, "What? I don't, I don't understand that." That's the first point. The second point I want to make in Galatians chapter five and verse twenty-two and twenty-three, and I go back to this many times. I, I go back to the, to the fruit of the spirit many times. Well, when we look at the the fruit of the spirit, what's one of those fruit? Peace. And we must first understand that obviously there must first be a tree before there's fruit. Right. Because fruit is evidence. Right. It's evidence of a, a person that is a child of God or a exactly. person that has been regenerate. Right. There's evidence again, and it shows. And, and love, you know, again, that's the first of the ninefold fruit of the Spirit. Right. When we show love towards one another, when a person has joy in their heart, when a person has peace, I've had a, a, a person, and I'm deviating for just a moment, but I, I've had a dear friend of mine, and, and he's become much closer over the past probably six to nine months since we've uh, I've been doing some other work, some contract work. He asked me one day, he said, man, I don't understand you. How do you have so much peace in your life? And I told him, I said, you go back four or five years? I wasn't there. Right. There was nothing but chaos and confusion, and right. not confusion about the scriptures. Right. My priorities were wrong. Right. And there was no peace there. Right. But this is where we find peace. Amen. And if we have any, any issues, any trouble, anything that bothers us, we should always go back to the Lord. 
and, and, and search for that peace because he is there always. The third and final point that I want to make is that in 1 Corinthians 14.33, when he tells us, he, he, again, he's referring to the churches. He's referring to the saints or the elect children of God. God instructs us. He instructs the churches to strive for peace. Amen. And we can see the mark of a true church when, when there is peace Amen. and there's order. Absolutely. Not trouble, not constant disturbances. Right. And I thank God, and this is why I thank God so much for this church, Amen. because there is that peace. Amen. And there is order. The Lord for Amen. Now again, peace is, is listed. It's, it's the third of the ninefold fruit of the Spirit, and there's significance in that. And I won't go into, into that, because that would take way too much time. But peace is, is, it is the greatest benefit of being a regenerate child of God. And it's not through success. It's not through money. Right. It's not through power. Because peace of the world is false. Right. It's a false peace. People may have it for a short period of time, but they're not going to have it for any length of time. Right. It's very short-lived. Right. John fourteen twenty seven tells us, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you, not as the world giveth, right. give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. And I know that these times that we're in right now and the, and the times that we're going through this, this virus, right. there are many people that don't have that peace. Right. There are many people that are confused. There are many that don't understand. But peace is there. Hmm. And sometimes we just have to stop right. and listen to that still small voice. Amen. And we've got to listen and stop. Because that's, again, this is where we're going to find our peace. Yes, it is. It's not in ourselves. Amen. It's not in the world. Right. And, I, and I thank God for that. Amen. You know, Christ sacrificed himself to make peace for man. And, and without man could have never never met the justice that was demanded by God. Exactly. I, I just I thank God. And again, I know that there are many that are confused. There are many that do not have that peace. Amen. Peace is there. Amen. And we must stop yeah. and listen yeah. to that still small voice. I thank you for your kind attention this morning. <clears throat> We'll try that with the next message, very encouraging message, very informative, a message that uh, we ought to uh, meditate upon and consider carefully. I love, in the various forms that is presented, the description of the finished work of Jesus Christ. That when he declared on the cross, it is finished, he then gave up the ghost. He died. They're consummating that testimony the testament. And in doing so, the gravity of those words, it is finished, cannot be measured by any human measurement. For in that declaration, concluding and placing in force that testament, he had saved eternally every one of his children. Our blessed and beloved Savior even said, he said, of all that Father had given me, I've lost none. He said, but I'm going to raise him up at the last day. What a blessed declaration that he would love us. And I examined myself as Paul described himself, oh, wretched man that I am. In Romans chapter 7, he says, in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. That that I would not, I do, and that that I do, I would not. Paul could not, could not understand from a human perspective why our Lord would include him in his testament. Neither can I. But I rejoice that he's placed in my heart that knowledge that we belong to him, that he's an everlasting friend. So if you would open your Bibles with me to Psalm number 46. Psalm number 46. And while you're looking at getting that, I want to mention this relative to Brother Todd's message. 
and the peace of God. When David wrote the 23rd Psalm, he says, The Lord is my shepherd. He leadeth me beside the still waters. There's a picture of peace there. We lay down in rest and peace in the green pastures. Teaching us that in Jesus Christ there is peace. There is that eternal peace that he secured between us and God the Father. But also there's a peace even when the storms of life are raging. There's a peace in Jesus Christ in this life. In Psalm number 46, I'd like to focus our attention. We'll come down to it in, in a moment, but I want to read it with you in verse number 4. In verse number 4, he mentions a river and a city. Now, it is a river and a city. He calls it the city and a river. He says, there is a river. He says, the streams thereof shall make glad the city of God. The holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. A tabernacle is a place in this context where one lives. It is good to know that our Lord lives with us. Now, when you study the Scripture, it's very important that you consider your subject in its context. Great errors are made when we take a text out of its context. So let's go back to his context. The psalmist says, God is. I have this marked often in my Bible. God is. I rejoice to consider. But what is God? God is. Personally, he's referring to what God is to me. He's writing it within the context of himself. But I like to consider what God is to me. So he says, God is. Our refuge. Now again, you have to pay attention to words, as uh, Brother Todd has pointed out, and don't forget the little word, our. God is not a refuge to everybody, but to those whom he has chosen, God the Father had chosen in Christ Jesus before the foundation of the world, uh, Ephesians 1 and 4, and those that he's given spiritual life to, John chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. Those that God has chosen, that he's given spiritual life to, God is our refuge. And what is a refuge? A refuge is, from a personal perspective, it is a place that I want to run and hide. It's one of the places I want to run to when something or someone is after me. I've been in those shoes. I've, I've been in places where there was no place to run. I mean, there was a place where you just had to hunker down right where you were. So, but a refuge is a place where there's sure protection. He's talking about the city. We'll come to it in a moment. That in this city, there is a refuge. And in that refuge, he'll just lead you, well, he'll just lead you to the still waters. And you can lay down in the green pastures where there's great and wonderful peace. Outside, there might be a war raging. Might be a mighty storm going on. But in the city that is nourished by these uh, streams from this wonderful river, there's peace, there's joy, and there's protection. You cannot be harmed. You know, when, she, when uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were about to be thrown in the fire, uh, furnace, they displayed a great sense of peace. And they told me, they said, well, you know, you might throw us in that furnace, but our God, whom we serve, he is able to deliver us. Uh, you know, he, he might not deliver us from this fire, but he's going to deliver us from you. Given the, us to understand, those men had peace in their heart, knew, knowing that God was right there with them. And they experienced it in reality in that fiery furnace when the Lord appeared as the fourth man walking in that fire with them. So God is our refuge. And by the way, when, we're, when we need strength, sometimes the trouble, the trial, the fear, the anxiety is so great that we feel helpless. We don't have the strength to overcome whatever it is that's threatening us. But he says, well, as God is our refuge, we can run to him and there we find protection and hiding from the trouble. God is our refuge 
And, well, he's our strength. When we just don't think that we have the strength to keep going, well, he's there to give us strength so that we can keep going. And notice how he explains it. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. So he's three things. He's a refuge, he's a strength, and he's our help in trouble. Well, a help, well, you know, sometimes... We just hit the um, we just hit the can't button, okay? I can't. Mom used to teach us children. He says can't. She said can't never uh, did do anything because it never tried. Well, there's times when we try and use all the strength, all the mental capacity that we have, and we still can't do it. That's when God shows up on the scene, and He lifts us up out of the miry clay. He takes us in his arms and he delivers us to that lovely, peaceful refuge that is established for us. And for the sake of time, that refuge is pro uh, prophecy, that city is prophecy of the church of Jesus Christ that we have today. Therefore, because this is true, because God is our refuge, our strength, and our help in trouble... Therefore, will I uh, will not we fear? He said, "We're not just going, we're just not going to be afraid because He is our refuge, our strength, and help." Notice now, we are not our own refuge. We are not our own strength. We are not our own help. But our Lord is our refuge, strength, and help. So we're He said, "Well, we're just not going to fear." Yes. Well, what, what what do we have to be afraid of if our Lord is on scene, a very present help in trouble? Therefore will not we fear, though the earth be removed, I mean that, and the mountains be carried into the sea, though the waters thereof be troubled, and though the mountains shake with a, uh, uh, with a swelling thereof. So what he's talking about, he said, everything that you can see around us, the mountains, the rivers, everything you can see around us is failing, they're falling down. All institutions, all powers are falling down, but our God is still on his throne. How amazing is that? Then he says, there is a river. While all of this commotion is going, all this trouble is happening, well, just don't forget that there's a river. There's a river, the streams, whereof shall make glad the city of God. The city of God is the church. So here we are this morning. We trust in the house of God, the dwelling of God, the, uh, the tabernacle of God, the place where God was. I have already felt God with us this morning. And I rejoice to know that we are in the tabernacle of God, in the house of God, where God meets with us, where we find a refuge, where we find strength, where we find help in trouble. He says, now the river and the streams thereof, a river. Now, think about a river a moment. A great river. While a river, in times past, that was the, the primary mode of transportation for supplies and materials. Great armies moved on rivers uh, for protection. A river is an amazing thing. If you flown over desert regions, which I've had the privilege of doing, if you look down and you can see little, little dark, squiggly lines across the desert, that's where the rivers are. There's life and there's provision on the rivers. And the little tributaries, the, uh, the streams that branch out from the rivers, well, they, they make glad the city because they provide for the city great supplies and materials and green things and loveliness. I love to watch a river just go gently by. There's beauty in it. There's majesty in it. And then the city is well provisioned because this river is her great supplier. Now, I'd like to go back to Genesis 2, may you? Would you go with me to Genesis chapter 1? Yeah, the Lord said, and uh, uh, Moses said, in the beginning, God, He created everything that is. In Genesis chapter 2, He continues that, and God had planted a garden. Join with me in Genesis chapter 2 and verse number 9. 
God said after he had planted the garden in Eden. By the way, that, that name Eden means pleasure. And God, and out of the ground, God made, um, uh, 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 out of the ground, made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden. And the tree of knowledge of good and evil, it was there as well. Then he says this concerning a river. And a river went out of Eden. A river went out of pleasure. So now, as we engage our thinking in the context, if this river went out of pleasure, what is that river carrying? What supply, what is the main supply of this river on the way to the city? It's carrying pleasure. And there's no greater pleasure, there's no greater pleasure this morning than in hearing the doctrine of grace. That God has saved a people that did and do not deserve to be saved. He has saved us to heaven by the shedding of the blood of His only begotten and beloved Son. When I see my Savior through, my, through the eye of faith hanging on that cross, when I see Him hanging there, and they're mocking Him, they're laughing at Him, and, and He having to have the power to command legions of angels to come and deliver Him, yet He continued to hang there, and he was waiting upon his hour at that moment when he would be made to be sin for us. Though he knew no sin, he would be made sin for us. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5 and 21, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him because he was shedding his blood. And we declared it is finished. He had saved his people from their sins and secured our eternal home in heaven all by grace because we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. John said in 1 John chapter 1, he says, He that saith he hath no sin deceives himself, and the truth is not in him. So it's by grace. That means he has given to us by inheritance. He's given to us this blessed grace that we don't deserve. Now, also he said, John said, he said, he that saith he hath no sin, deceives himself the truth is not him. But furthermore, he makes God a liar because God, he said, we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's a river. Went out of Eden, the place of pleasure, to water the garden, and from thence it is parted into four heads. The, every word of God is important. Four heads. The name of the first in verse number 11 is Pison. Pison. That word Pison means increase. That means things are going, I mean there's going to be increase of blessings and joys along the way as this river is flowing to the city. Uh, the city of God, the blessedness of God, there's going to be a great increase. And it has increased every generation. It has increased. But not only that, it increases in joy and peace. The closer we come uh, to this hour, the greater our peace and joy. The name of the first is Pison. That is uh, it which compasses the whole land of Havilah. Uh, where there is gold, there's beauty. There's an abundance of gold. And the gold of that land is good. There is Bedlam and there's onyx stone. And the name of the sex, uh, second river is Gihon. All of this is coming from the place called pleasure. Gihon. The word Gihon literally means bursting forth. And that's what I am this morning. By the grace of God, I'll tell you what, I believe that Brother Todd and I and all of y'all would stay with us all afternoon. We could be here because the Spirit of God is here and it's bursting forth with the goodness and the greatness of our God. And with it comes the peace of God. It reminds us, it's like the Lord told the disciples of John, Go shew John again these things. Remind him of the wonderful things that our Lord is doing for us. And so it's bursting forth with the goodness of God, the joy of God. And while we're thinking on these things, the trouble is raging around us. The wars are going on around us. And uh, just awful things are happening. But for this moment, there's a refuge. There's strength. There's help in our time of trouble, and we're delivered to this hour of peace. 
Gihon, the, uh, uh, the same is it that compasses the whole uh, land of Ethiopia. And the name of the third river is Hittichel. That word means rapid. Oftentimes you find uh, the writers in the scripture that they're praying to God, come, I need you right now, Lord. Come right now. I need you to comfort me. I need you to lift me up. And that's what we ought to be praying across this country. Lord, the river is there. The streams are there. The rivers are there. And the city is there. Lord, come right now. And beg not to demand, but to plead. Lord, come now and deliver us. Send, Father, what it takes to, uh, for us to recover from this awful virus. Uh, send, O oh Heavenly Father, what it takes for us to get on with our lives. And when it is done, Father, move in the hearts of your people in their minds that they will come and sit and fill these pews, that they would fill the houses of worship, that they will sing praises to you, that the prayers will go forward and there will be great crying out uh, to worship the Lord God and amens will fill this country as, uh, as, as the ministers of the gospel uh, declare the goodness and the greatness of our God. Hedekel, that is it which uh, goeth toward the east of Assyria. And the fourth uh, river is Euphrates. The, that word Euphrates literally means fullness. That means my cup is running over with the goodness and the greatness of our God. Uh, with His help, with His strength, uh, with His mercy, His grace, my cup is running over. It is full because He's the great provider of the things of our God. Now, Let's move on to the city. I want you to go back with me to Psalm number 87. Psalm number 87. <clears throat> Many rivers. As a matter of fact, Revelation chapter 22 ends with a river. It was a river that, uh, um, that, um, that was seen um, by, by John, uh, who received the revelation from God. Now I want to look at, um, at the city, Psalm uh, number, uh, number 87, a beautiful psalm, uh, as all of them are, but it's a beautiful psalm describing the city of God. Psalm number 87. Yeah, I, I do have Psalm 87 in my Bible. I'm sure it's in here. There it is right there. Psalm number 87, verse number 1, speaking of the Lord. The pronoun, first of, uh, the pronoun of God, his foundation. That means his strength, his, uh, his continuance, his continuance is everlasting. His foundation uh, teaches us that in the city of God, he is our strength. All the house of God is built upon his foundation. His foundation is the holy, is in the holy mountains. And by the way, there's more to that than we can preach in a whole day. Because you remember, you remember when, um, when the Lord told Abraham, He said, Abraham, take thy son, thy only son, the son that you love, you take him to the land of Moriah. And the land of Moriah, to the place that I will show thee, the Moriah means seen of God. There was a place in the mountains of Moriah that God said, I'm going to show you something there. And so what He showed him is that his, the sacrifice of his son was not required, but that, that, he, that God the Father would sacrifice his own beloved son for us. Another subject for another time. His foundation is the holy mountains. The Lord uh, loveth the gates of Zion. means he loves his city, the city of God, the house of God, the refuge of God, the church of Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ said concerning this foundation, he said, upon this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell shall what? not prevail against it, uh, telling us that it is secure. When the Lord comes back, there's going to be somebody somewhere worshiping in the church of Jesus Christ, the tabernacle of God, somewhere on this earth. The Lord loveth the gates of Zion more than all the dwellings of Jacob. He says, glorious things, speaking of this city, glorious things are, are spoken of thee. Glorious things. It means wonderful things. When you speak glorious of something or somebody, you talk about how wonderful they look, right? And how wonderful they make you look because you get to see them. And so I could spend another ten minutes here talking about all of y'all this morning. There's one, two, three, four, five, six. Count me here this morning. I'm not looking at me, but I'm looking at y'all. And so I could tell the whole world how glorious y'all look this morning. I tell you, uh, from my spiritual view, y'all are the most beautiful people in the whole world this morning. 
I wish I could see everybody that's looking at us on the way to the internet. And I, I know that they're beautiful as well. They are glorious. You're lovely. You're my family. You're my friends. You're my joint heirs to the testimony of Jesus Christ. He says, glorious things are spoken of thee, O city of God. See, Lord, punctuating. He says, this is true. He said, I don't care how much you say good about the house of God, you still haven't said enough. You can preach it day after day after day, but you still can't say enough about how glorious uh, the house of God is. We'll sing that song in a minute, the Lord with him. Then he says, I will make mention, mention of Rahab, of Babylon, to them that know me. Uh, behold, Philistia and Tyre and Ethiopia. This man was born there. And Zion, uh, and of Zion it shall be that this and that man was born uh, in her. Now, you know, if you're proud of your city where you came from, if you're proud, then you're proud to say, I was born there. And if it's a very notable city, then um, anybody that was born there, they're quick to tell you where they were born. It's almost like folks who have their favorite uh, uh, football team. They all like to tell you, that this is my team. I like this team. And I'm going to call Danny this morning because I guarantee you I'll get in trouble if I do. But whatever your team is, you're proud to say, this is my team. I associate with them. So anybody who was born in this city, that means we have spiritual life in the house of God. We ought to be, uh, we ought to be quick and say, my father is the Lord God Almighty, and he has given me an inheritance in his house that I have the joy of meeting together with him and with his saints because the house of God is where his habitation is. This is that man was born uh, in her, and the highest uh, uh, himself shall uh, establish her. That means the highest means this speaking to God. I mean, there's none higher than him, more, none more powerful than he, none having more authority than he, um, and he is the one that established her. Then to establish has a context. Not only did he build it, but he's the maintainer of her. Generation after generation, he still maintains her. The Lord shall count. Did you know the Lord does mathematics? I guarantee he does. The Lord shall count. So what's the counting? You know, and I, I, I remember teaching my kids how to count. I don't remember when I learned how to count. That was too long ago. But I remember teaching my children how to count. We started off one, two, three. One, two, three. I'd get them down to one, two, three, and I'd say, okay, one, two, three, four, five. We get up to five. Then we got to ten. And, and when we got up to a hundred, there's something magical about a hundred. When we got up to a hundred, I mean, they were happy and we were happy. And so when visitors would come over and we'd get them to demonstrate that they could count to a hundred. The visitors didn't really care. But, you know, they, they made the children feel good by telling them, well, that is good. Can you do it again? You know, and so, so it, it was a, counting is an important thing, especially when you're one of the ones that is counted. Now watch this. The Lord shall count when he writeth up the people. You know what that means? You know, in, 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 the, uh, in, the, uh, in the book of God, in the mind of God, he knows exactly how many is in that book. He wrote this book before the foundation of the world. This is a ledger in the mind of God, and he knows exactly how many is in that book. And all who are written in that book, he has counted them, and he's the perfect mathematician, but he's also the perfect and almighty God. You ever lose anything? Have you ever lost a $20 bill? Brother Todd did because he gave me one one day, but it ain't lost, I still got it, Jim. I lose things, but I assure you that God, when he, when he tattles it up on the last day, when he tattles it up on the last day, there's going to be just as many in that book as there was on the day that he said, let us make man. So he said, the Lord shall count when he writeth up the people that this man was born there. He said, there, I'm going to be, I am a citizen of this city. I am now, and I will always be a citizen of this city. Now, Hebrews 11 and 10, Abraham looked for a city. He was looking for it, just like they were looking for the Testament. They were pointing toward that. They were looking for it. They didn't have it then. What they had was a prophecy of that Testament. They had a prophecy of the city. They had a prophecy of the river. 
And we get to rejoice. Now, we've got it so much better because what we have today is what they were looking for. They were looking for the Messiah. Well, the Messiah has come and he's on his throne today. And Job, though Job could see him, he said, I know that my Redeemer liveth in Job chapter 9, but the Redeemer hadn't come yet, but today he has come and he has saved his people from their sins. Go back with me now to Psalm number 46. For all this river, he says, there is a river. All the streams are lovely. They're beautiful. The streams whereof shall make glad the city. And I'm glad this morning. I don't want to quit. I don't want to leave, y'all. I want to stay here. I want to keep talking about the things of the Lord. Because the longer I think on these things, the happier I get. And we're actually, I might even shout. How about that? that be all right? Amen. All right, he says in verse number five. He says, God is in the midst of her. That means you may think you're alone. We may be spread out all over the, all over the country. We may be spread out everywhere, but I want to tell you something. God is in the midst of the house of God. If he's in the midst, that means he's the, he's, he, held, he holds the preeminent seat. He holds the seat of authority, the seat of power. He's the protector. He's the leader. He's the one that leads us uh, uh, by the still waters. He makes us to lie down in the green pastures because in this city is our refuge from the things of the world. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her. And that right early. That means God is going to arrive on the scene just in time. He's going to get there when it's just right. He knows the right time. You know, sometimes when we're involved in something, we're doing something, we don't know what the right time is. We're just guessing at it a lot of times. We just make the best kid, guess we can, and keep going. But God knows exactly when the right moment is. Now, I, I firmly believe with every, every fiber that's in me, at the time that God knows best, He's going to bring an antidote. He's going to bring uh, something to put a stop to this virus. And He's going to steal the fears of the people of this country. He'll do that. All right? Well, he talks about trouble now. God is on the scene. He's in his city. We have this refuge. It's the heathen raged. The kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice. The earth melted. He said, when trouble was going on, God just spoke. He just said, peace, be still, and then the earth melted. I mean, everything just ceased around him because everything is subject to his power. Then he says, the Lord of hosts is with us. He reminds us over and over again, the Lord of hosts is with us. We're not alone. Sometimes we think we're alone. Sometimes we think we're isolated, but we're not. Because the Lord of hosts. And what does it mean, the Lord of hosts? Don't skip these words. I know it's five after twelve. But you folks at home are sitting in your lounge chairs and on your sofas. And you're perfectly comfortable drinking your iced tea. So just sit still for a moment. The Lord of hosts means... The Lord of hosts refers to the uh, commander of a great army. The host is the great army. The symbolism there is the God of great power. There's no power like God's. He has perfect, absolute power. He's om omnipotent, meaning that he has all power. So he says, the Lord of hosts, the Lord of great power is with us. We may think that we don't have the strength or have the ability, we're not going to make it. But let me assure you, because God's people are, are falling down before God in that the throne of grace, He is hearing, and the day is going to come when this is going to pass from us. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Selah. He pumps away. This is true. Come, behold the works of the Lord. He says, just stop and consider what great things God has already done for us. Why is it necessary to study the Old Testament? Because in the Old Testament, in the beginning, there was God. And God said, let there be life, and let there be this, let there be that, let there be the other. And God took uh, uh, the very uh, ground, and he formed man, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and he became a living soul. And just remember that he's the same God that brought the flood that saved, Adam, uh, and saved Noah and his family. He's the same God that has uh, made the sea part. He is the same God that have done, has done all of these things. The same God is on his throne this morning. He says, come, behold the works of the Lord. What desolations he hath made on the earth. That means he got the victory. Every time he gets the victory. Now look at that verse number nine. He maketh wars to cease. You know, that means the wars rage. They do come. But God, God moves on the sea. He says, okay, that's enough war. <laughs> this, this war, this battle has gone on long enough, and he puts a stop to it. We, men think they put a stop to it. 
But God raises up men. He raises up uh, 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 institutions. He raises up uh, organizations. He raises up countries. He raises up... He's going to raise up a man, a woman, somebody that has the knowledge and is going to put together something uh, medically to stop this virus. I believe it. I just, I'm absolutely convinced of it. So he maketh the wars to cease. He puts a stop to them until the end of the earth. I don't care how long this earth goes on, a war is going to come up, but he's going to cause them to stop at a time pleasing to him. He uh, breaketh the bow. He cutteth the spear asunder. He burneth the chariot in fire. Then he says to us, he's back to us now. He says, oh yeah, there's all kinds of bad things going on, but just be still. Just hold it, man. Just just stop for a minute and consider. Let's think about this for a minute. Just think spiritually. Just be still and know. What do we know? We know that there's a river. And oh my goodness, there's wonderful things coming from the place called pleasure to our city, the habitation of God. Just be still. Just think for a moment. You know what happens when you get afraid? Your, your heart starts pounding. Your blood starts rushing. And your brain just starts firing in every direction. And all of a sudden, you, you're making irrational judgments and decisions. You don't know what to do. Then you go haywire. You cry and you moan and you groan like the children of Israel. God, He just delivered them from Pharaoh and got to the Red Sea. Well, they forgot that God, could, that who could do all of those things down in Egypt... What happened to him? Is he still around? Did he leave us? Well, God demonstrated that he was right there with him because he opened up the sea and walked across on dry land. We need to remember that that same God is on this scene with him. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. That means when the victory comes, we'll meet together and we will declare our God got the victory over this thing. Just like when Hurricane Michael came, came through here, this whole region was devastated. I mean, it was a, it was, it would look like a major war had come through here. We couldn't, for the first uh, few days, we couldn't even get to this church building. It was that bad. But God provided, He said, help. He said, uh, uh, strong backs. And He uh, lifted us up and encouraged us and helped us. Now we're restoring, by the grace and mercy of God, the beauty of our city. We have a lovely church building. Nobody's here. Well, there are. There was uh, two, four, six of us here today. Uh, but there's a lot of folks joining us today, rejoicing with us, because God has blessed us. He got us through that. He's going to get us through this. And probably in a year or so, something else is going to come up. He's going to get us through that too. Be still and know that I am God, and be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us, and the God of Jacob is our refuge. We're not alone, but the God who has all power is right with us today. And he's our help, and he's our strength, he's our best friend, and he's our comforter. In our hymn, home, to hymn number 213. Hymn number 213. At this point, we normally give invitation for members. So there's a lot of folks electronically, but if anybody's interested in joining the church, you just put a note on Facebook, and I guarantee you we'll figure out a way to get it taken care of. We do give an invitation for members to our beloved little church. The title of this hymn is Glorious Things of Thee Are Spoken, taken from the song that we just addressed. Oh, glorious things of Thee are spoken, Zion City of Thangan. He whose word cannot be broken, for me for his own love. On the rock of ages found him, what can share my pure repose? With salvation walls around it, thou mayst smile at all thy foes. 
See the stream of living waters springing from eternal love. Well supply thy sons and daughters and all fear of womb removed. Blessed in her on tons of Zion, washed in the Redeemer's blood. Jesus, whom their soul rely on, thou mayest give the way to God. Round each high, the patient hovering, see the cloud of our and dim. For our glory and our covering, Showing that the Lord did <clears throat> The steroiding from the phantom, Life by night and chain by day, Thus we feed <coughs> man, um, Which he gives us when they pray. Savior, him from Zion City, I through grace a member am. Let the world deride or pity, I will glory in thy name. Fading is the worldly pleasure, all his foes did pomp and show. Solid joy, the lasting pleasure, none but Zion's children know. <clears throat> Please forgive my cracking voice. Thank you all for joining us today. We appreciate your prayers. Lord willing, we'll meet again the same way on Wednesday evening at 6.30, and then again um, next Sunday morning at 10.30. We'll continue to meet this way until we get there all clear so that our church family can gather together again. Remember to pray for our nation, our leaders, and pray for the churches, and pray for the pastors that are trying to keep their flock encouraged. Let us pray. Amen. Mm hmm Yeah. How about that? So we just, uh, so sir, just shared with us that not only do we have our church family and folks around um, the country listening to us, but folks as far away as Africa are listening to us. And we thank you all for joining with us, and we pray that the Lord has blessed and you've received a blessing. Let us pray in closing. Heavenly Father, we do thank you, Lord, for your sweet mercy and your grace. We thank you, Father, that you loved us so much that you sent your only begotten and most beloved Son into this world to fulfill the testament to secure our home in heaven. And thank you, Father, for giving us the feeling deep down in our souls that we have part and we're counted among that number with those that thy darling Son saved to eternal heaven when he declared, it is finished. Thank you, Father, that in this life you've given us the church city, the church, our refuge, a place of help, a place of comfort, a place of pleasure and joy, a refuge from this world. Please, O oh God in heaven, bless our leaders, bless our nation, bless, O oh Heavenly Father, those who are sick, those who have lost their loved ones, those who are on the, on the front lines, Heavenly Father, protecting us. Bless them and protect them and help them as they go about helping others. And bless each of us, Father, that we would know how to be a blessing, a help, and encouragement to all of those around us. Please, O oh God in heaven, have mercy upon us. And bless, if it could be thy great and glorious will, that this virus would soon pass from us. Not only this, Father, but whatever else might be troubling thy children, deliver them from it, Father. Kindly, O oh Lord, look upon us with sweet mercy. And as we live out our life, forgive us of our many sins. For it is in Christ's blessed and most adorable name we do pray.